I welcome you to the transport connectivity session, which will have five presentations uh, that will uh, show some study, some aspect of rail, sea, and air transportation. My name is Nicola Bianchi. I'm a diplomatic consular at the uh, Italian Embassy in Singapore and have the responsibility for international relationship uh, between Italy, Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia. And um, well, as an Italian, I'm quite expert about connectivity between Europe and Asia, since the first uh, connection was made by an Italian, Marco Polo, in the 13th centuries, and at least the, the, the first documented uh, travel from, uh, from Europe uh, to Asia. And just to, to give you the scale, uh, it takes uh, to Marco Polo three years to go from uh, Italy, from Venice, uh, to, to China. Then, uh, and this was the first uh, uh, connection, uh, physical connection. Then a second uh, connection by another Italian was in the uh, 16th centuries by a monk, Matteo Ricci, and he came to China and then he became almost Chinese. And um, he provided uh, really the first map of the world in Chinese character and the first dictionary between Chinese and Latin, since it was a monk who was speaking Latin, not Italian. And, uh, and therefore, also this helped a lot uh, in the connection between uh, Europe and, and uh, East Asia. Uh, okay, coming back to uh, last year, uh, uh, the transport connectivity between Europe and, and Asia had a very strong development uh, in the recent year. Uh, the strongest uh, development uh, in, uh, that had Europe had have, have with uh, other parts of the world, of course. And uh, certainly what uh, uh, is very now will be very nice in, in our presentation that uh, nowadays, uh, not only the cost, uh, the efficiency and the time are important parameter, but uh, of course, uh, the sustainability, the environmental and uh, social impact, the safety, these are key aspects in uh, the development of this uh, transport connectivity. And this is also very true at, uh, if you think about uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, epidemic and uh, yesterday was a session dedicated uh, also to this impact of this COVID-19 uh, epidemic on the, on the all kind of, of connection between uh, um, uh, Europe and uh, East Asia and uh, you know that the situation is quite difficult now I don't know how many of you had uh, my experience I fly twice uh, one in March and one in, in July from uh, Europe to Singapore and uh, in July, we were three passengers three passenger on the road flight uh, with KLM flight uh, from Amsterdam to here. So, of course, situation is quite challenging. Uh, we are thinking positive, but of course, it will take uh, some time so, to be back uh, uh, in the previous situation. So, now I give the floor to the speaker because our agenda is very, is very dense. And so, I ask the speaker just to be uh, in time. So our first speaker is uh, uh, Richard Pomfret. Uh, he has been a professor of economics at the University of Adelaide since 92, and after a Jan Monique Chair of the Economics uh, European Integration since 2017. And before moving to Adelaide, he was also professor in Washington, uh, Bologna, and Nanjing. Uh, he has acted as advisor to our adv um, Australian government as well and also to consultant as international organization like World Bank, Asian Development Bank, OECD, and United Nations. He has wrote many books. Uh, I apologize, he's just mentioned the last one that is very, very well uh, suited for this uh, um, um, conference. And the title is Central Asian Economies in the 21st Centuries, Paving a New Silk Road. And Richard will talk about the uh, real links between uh, East Asia and uh, Europe, which compared to the sea and air links so were developed last, but which have uh, had a strong increase, increase in the recent year. So Richard, please, uh, the floor is yours. Switch on your microphone and put the slide. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola, for the, for the introduction. Um, I will try very quickly to um, cover the topic. I, can you see my, my slides on the screen? Uh, don't worry, yeah. I'll share them for, for you, Richard. Just uh, one second. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, you should see them by now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, th thanks very much, Matteo. Um, 
just to, to repeat the introduction, I mean, rail services have been a, a pretty small part of, uh, of, of connectivity, but it's been one that's growing very quickly. And so I'll try to present some information about this and talk a little bit about the implications and try to keep that within the 10 minutes. Okay, if we could move to the next slide, please. Matt, do you, do you control the slides or do I do that? Uh, I, I do that and hopefully you should see the second slide right now. Yeah, great. Um, so this is not a mystery. I'll, I'll come up with the main conclusions now just in case I don't get through the whole thing. The main point of the presentation is to um, document that since 2011, over the last decade, we've had the establishment of regular freight rail services between Europe and, and China. Um, my background paper, which is available to anybody on request, um, gives more documentation about the development of these links um, and argues that its origins were, were market driven in response to demands of lead firms in Eurasian value chains. Um, and these rail services are consistent with um, both EU and Chinese hopes for improved connectivity, reflected in major foreign economic policy announcements. Um, Belt and Road Initiative, obviously on China's part, connecting Europe and Asia on the EU's part. And my main argument is that because the, these links were originally market driven, I would expect that they would um, be fairly sustainable. I'll also mention very briefly that uh, also on um, environmental grounds, these are sustainable links. So moving to the next slide, I'll move very quickly through the next few slides. Yeah. The, the background to any of these overland transports to talk about the Silk Roads, the um, main reason I want to just mention the Silk Roads that existed from around 200 before the Christian era, is that these were obviously profitable links, these overland links between Ch China and the Middle East. If we could look at the next slide. Um, next slide, please. Oh. Matt, next slide. Um, one of the features of, of economic booms is that um, places where they're taking place usually build the tallest building in the world. Um, this is a picture of Bukhara, where the minaret uh, there from 1127 was the tallest building in the world then. Usually presages, as we saw with the Empire State Building in 1928 or the Patronus Towers in Malaysia just before the Asian crisis. This happened slightly before Shingis Khan came and caused a bit of disruption to the Silk Road, but still a sign of the, the prosperity of the, these overland routes. It all changes. If I could have the next slide, please, Matteo. It all changes, and I'm sorry, Nicola, this is not an Italian, this is a Portuguese. Um, it changes when Vasco da Gama discovers uh, the route to India, the bottom of South Africa. And if we could move to the next slide, once that is happening, it's kind of a fairly straightforward path to today where we have container ships. Um, we heard in the, on the first day about um, a Danish position in, in um, maritime transport. This is a mess, boat, you know, holding several, you know, 20,000 containers. Um, if I could see the next slide, please, that the consequence of this was that although there were overland rail links, existed and um, the track existed yeah overland routes were simply not competitive with um with maritime routes um over the next 500 years after after 1500 um the trans-siberian railway connected pacific russia to to europe um not much used for through traffic especially after the sino soviet split they um in a very Last year, or next to the last year of the Soviet Union's existence, a new link was um, built between Kazakhstan and China. It's mostly carried bilateral trade, um, coal and iron and steel from Kazakhstan to China. The EU um, focused a lot on a Traseca link from Central Asia to Europe in the 1990s. Um, not really competitive because of the costs of, um, uh, of crossing the Caspian Sea and then the Black Sea. And on UN maps, there was a trans... Asian main line that ran from China through Iran, through Turkey to Europe. It's really just a line on a map, um, not used much for, for trade. Um, we see this, this changing very rapidly in, after 2011. Uh, next slide, please, Matt. 
the, what we, we see um, happening is we get um, trial runs um, indicating the possibility of, um, of freight using rail lines, particularly, I think the most important were um, trains commissioned by German car companies, Volkswagen, BMW, to take components from that Germany to their assembly factories in China. And these trips show that overland rail transport was feasible, but it was not useful to anybody else because these were um, commissioned trains for, for a, sing, a single user. And what really changes the whole picture, if we look at the next slide, is when we start to see in 2011 and 2012, we start to see more individual trains connecting Western China, Sichuan province, Chongqing municipality with Europe. This followed a policy in China of encouraging investment in the west of the country that had led to very large electronics factories being built by, by Foxconn who assembled Apple products um, by HP and printers. And they were looking for a route to send the finished products to, to Europe. And rail promised much faster times than maritime transport at higher cost, but the trade-off was, was worthwhile. And what we see then is an expansion of the network, next slide please, that we see uh, in 2013, 2014, 2015, we see more and more cities trying to sponsor um, trains running between China and Europe and back from Europe, Europe to China. Um, often by giving subsidies, which confuses the picture a little bit, but we see that the benefits, particularly for um, products that are in global value chains, were that these re reduced trade costs in terms of time and in terms of uncertainty, even if it cost more than our time routes. And the overland rail routes were taking about 12 or 13 days compared to 45 to 50 days by train from Western China to, to Rotterdam. Um, if we look, next slide please, we see by 2017, there was quite a dense network. This is the China Railway Express route map. Why do I choose May 2017? This is when the Belt and Road Initiative was formally launched. And I think this tells you that a lot of it, this had actually predated the, the BRI. If we look at the volume of traffic, next slide, please. We see that the volume of trade uh, increased very rapidly from virtually zero going by rail in 2010. It's increased to 100,000 um, containers in 2016, 300,000, over 300,000 last year, and clearly going to be even more this year. It's a striking feature, it's this very rapid growth, and essentially not disrupted by, by COVID. And if we can look at the next slide, please, we see that this advantage seems to be increasing as more traffic goes by rail, you know, the time has been reduced, the um, logistics have been improved, you know, the change of gauge at the border of China and Russia and Belarus and, and Poland has been speeded up. Meanwhile, as we saw in the previous um, presentation at the plenary session, you know, shipping has slowed down as to try to reduce the environmental effects um, and the, um, the cost of, of air transport has gone up. So the relative attractiveness of, of rail has been improving we look at the next slide, we see surprisingly that even in this year of, of COVID, we see big increases in the amount of traffic going by rail between China and Europe, Europe and China. And I think this is largely because the disruption to the maritime networks, you know, boats being held in port, not being able to move, has increased the advantage of, um, of rail. The, uh, number of containers being shipped on the rail land bridge in May of this year was a record 52,000, which to me is really indicative of, of a very rapid growth of, of the rail transport. Uh, it's clearly still no more than between five and 10% of total um, transport, a little bit more if you do it by value, a little bit less if you do it by bulk, um, but it is growing very rapidly as part of the, the range of choices for, for traders. Moving to, to the next slide, please. Um, and we see that this is to some extent being supported by, next slide, please. This is being supported by 
policies that are being introduced in China and in Europe. Um, it's consistent clearly with the Belt and Road Initiative, as I've already mentioned. It's also consistent with the EU um, documents on connectivity, the, in, the uh, moves to expand the trans-European transport network through the, um, the eastern neighbourhood. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so I, I think the, the, the potential for change is very high. If we move to the, the next slide, which is my last slide, as I hope I'm keeping just about into my time limit. Um, the conclusions that I, I draw are, first of all, that the, the Eurasian land bridge um, that um, began by connecting regional value chains has expanded very rapidly. And this market-driven development preceded the, um, and complemented the major foreign economic policy announcements by China and by, by the EU. Um, so I see that as a good sign for its sustainability. Also, when we, we mention the environmental effects, you know, at current um, stage of technology, you know, shipping a, a container from China to Europe or vice versa um, creates you know, fewer um, emissions in terms of um, uh, tons of carbon dioxide than maritime shipment or air shipment. So yeah, yes, yes. I think this is a, a development that's not fully recognized, but it's potentially very important. Thank you very much. And I hope Nikolai kept within my time limit there. Much, Richard, uh, their question. Uh, Richard, uh, um, uh, as far as I can understand, uh, the transport to transportation can become very competitive when starting at another point uh, far from the sea. I mean, uh, if you start from Central Europe to Chengdu, uh, the time uh, uh, and the cost uh, are much less than starting from uh, Piraeus or Hamburg uh, to Shanghai. Is this correct? And uh, if so, uh, uh, which is roughly the amount, the volume of, uh, of the um, of the of the market of the trade that involve uh, uh, location uh, not really close to the sea. I mean, uh, is five percent, fifty percent? Can you provide some rough estimate on on the comparison uh, sea to sea and uh, land to land? Thank you. Yeah, no, that, Nicola, that's uh, exactly true. I mean, it, the, um, moving from an inland part of China to an inland part of Europe, this is where the advantage of the rail is, is stronger. So we see um, the emergence of hubs like Łódź in Poland become very, very important in this trade. Um, and so it, it was a bit slow to start, but it developed very quickly, the, this, these links for, for the Eastern members of, of the European Union. Um, yeah, um, what else was the part of the question? Um, Yeah, I mean, I would also emphasize that there are links. We, we, we have an area as a, um, a co-sponsor of the conference, in a sense. Um, the links to Southeast Asia, in fact, um, also improve the, the, the potential for using the, this as a land bridge. You know, the, the bigger the network, the more valuable it, it becomes. Yeah. And so I think that that is a, a really important point. You just shipping from Shanghai to Hamburg, yep, yeah, that's maximum advantage for, for sea. But if you want to um, link to uh, interior destinations, Central Asia, Eastern Europe, Ukraine, then the land bridge by rail, I think, get, becomes more advantageous. Okay, there is a question from Alessandro Albana. Um, I just read for you. It will be interesting to understand whether uh, the relatively high environmental sustainability or railway, railway transportation uh, versus uh, maritime transportation, of course, enjoys potential to attract a growing public investment from those governments, including China, that seem to be focusing increasing on economic growth and uh, environmental sustainability. Which is your opinion about this? Yeah, I mean, my, I think that the, the comment is, is, is right, that it is very attractive, um, and we do see a, a major part of the Belt and Road Initiative from China's perspective has been improving rail connectivity. There are many plans on the drawing board for high rail connect, high speed rail connections, which would further increase the advantage of, um, of rail. 
Um, the only caveat I would say is that there are also improvements happening on the maritime side, as we just heard in, in the presentation in, in the plenary. Um, so predicting the future is always a little bit difficult. But I think that the, um, the environmental sustainability of rail look you know, very positive. Okay, thank you, Richard. Thanks a lot for this presentation and give you uh, give us some uh, hope on the future, but also that the present uh, on rail uh, rail transportation is, is solid at least. Uh, it is more solid than other kind of, of uh, transportation. Thanks a lot. So now uh, I want to introduce Plamen uh, uh, Tonchev. Uh, he's a senior researcher and head of the ASEAN unit at the Institute of International Economic Relations in Greece. Uh, we have a lot of connection with Greece today, yeah? that is very good. <laughs> Great speaker, our location in Greece. And Plamen sits on a new chapter of the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific Committee, and as a representative of this uh, Institute of International Economic Relations, uh, he's a founding member of uh, the European Think Tank Network on China. He published a lot of books, uh, monographs, and peer review articles, and uh, in many institutions uh, in European uh, ASEAN country. Uh, here is a research interest uh, related to the sustainable connectivity, in particular the Belt Road Initiative, as well as the EU strategies on connecting uh, Europe and Asia. And uh, his publication cover, therefore, Central and Eastern Europe, the Western Balkan, the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean, and Central Asia. And uh, in his talk, he will address some issues about uh, sustainability in the maritime transportation. So it's very connected to the, to the main talk uh, of the main session before, uh, with the ambitious goals of lowering the greenhouse gas emission. So, uh, Plamen, you have the floor. You can proceed. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I hope you can hear me clearly. And uh, can I ask Matteo, please? Yes, I can see my slideshow. Thanks very much, Matteo. Um, let me tell you that I'll, I'll literally gallop through my presentation uh, within the next 10 minutes, I hope. Um, and I hope that uh, I'll provide some answers, but I, I warn you that I'll clearly raise more questions than, than answers that I will provide. Can we move on to the next slide, please, Matteo? To have a quick look, right, very good. To have a quick look at the, the set of transport modalities between Europe and Asia, it's quite clear that maritime uh, is dominant. Um, back in 2017, maritime routes, including intermodal transports, accounted for about 96% of the whole volume uh, of commodities, um, goods you know, transported between Europe and Asia back and forth. That's related to 70% of the value because some high value commodities are still airborne. But uh, otherwise, uh, it, uh, maritime clearly is dominant. Uh, I would agree with uh, Richard, uh, who uh, spoke previously about rail and its growing share in transport connectivity between Europe and Asia. That's true. But for the time being, uh, maritime, and I think in the foreseeable future, uh, maritime connectivity will remain dominant. Um, let's move on to the next slide, please, so that we uh, save time. Uh, I think this is, uh, I, I don't know whether you can see this slide clearly, uh, probably not, but let me tell you this, that if you have a look at the left-hand column on this slide, you'll see the 10 top shipping nations in the world, starting from Greece, which has the most expensive, not the largest, but the most expensive commercial fleet in the world for the time being. And then if you can uh, actually see the 10 nations, you'll see that nine out of 10 are actually in Asia and Europe. The United States, that's right, thank you, Matteo. The United States is the only non-European or non-Asian nation on this list. You see Greece, Japan, China, Singapore, Norway, Germany, South Korea, the UK, and Denmark. So that gives you an inkling of the importance of uh, Asia and Europe in, in global shipping. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. Uh, now, shipping is, of course, uh, immensely important, but at the same time, it's a big polluter. We have to acknowledge this. 
Uh, these are the key negative effects of shipping on the marine environment. Ballast, you know, ballast water, which is uh, discharged by ships. Uh, it's also, it's been recorded that very often ships actually transfer biological material, including invasive alien species, say from the Black Sea to the South China Sea, or from the Atlantic Ocean to the, uh, the Pacific. Um, there's, of course, oil spills. Um, literally a month ago, there was this large oil spill uh, next to, to Mauritius. There was a Japanese tanker involved in it. And about 10 days ago, there was a Greek tanker off the coast of Sri Lanka involved in a, yet another accident. It's a sad reality we have to keep in mind. Of course, there's also the dumping of waste, such as garbage and sewage. Cruisers are very much involved in this. There's the noise pollution effect. I understand this uh, uh, negatively affects fish reproduction. Whales are particularly affected by this. And the last one, which I think is arguably the biggest negative effect, is, of course, air pollution, which is directly related to uh, climate change because of the emission of greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gases. Um, let's move on to the next slide, please. Speaking about air pollution, of course, and um, greenhouse uh, gases uh, related to uh, shipping, um, it's been already mentioned that shipping was not a focus of attention of the Paris Accord on combating climate change, and it's not included in most national climate commitments. Yet the International Maritime Organization, IMO, has rightly prioritized this issue. In 2018, it came up with its uh, decision, strategic and I would say historic decision, to prioritize um, greenhouse uh, gases in shipping. And then it suggested, and what it's now been adopted, a staggered strategy towards reducing uh, greenhouse gases in shipping. Uh, starting from January this year, last January, uh, all shipping companies are forced, they're obliged, you know, to take measures to reduce their um, uh, GH, uh, sorry, uh, greenhouse gases emissions. Uh, the final point being 2050, the, uh, the, the, uh, the middle of this century. Um, the key point in this IMO decision is that sulfur content in um, fuels should be reduced from what used to be the ceiling of 3.5% down to 0.5%. Let's move on to the next slide, please, because uh, we are um, really short of time. Uh, what are the implications of this uh, IMO uh, strategy? Starting from last January, shipping companies will have to uh, reduce the sulfur content. So what are the options they are looking at? Well, basically, they will have to uh, switch to uh, low sulfur fuel oil or very low sulfur fuel oil, perhaps marine gas. Some of them, are, some of the shipping companies are considering LNG, uh, liquefied natural gas, uh, which is not entirely uh, green, uh, greenhouse gas free because there's methane in it, but still it, it's, uh, it's cleaner than what used to be um, the key uh, fuels in, in the past. Uh, and of course, the other uh, option that shipping companies are considering is using devices, let's say filters, the so-called scrubbers, uh, in order to continue uh, to use uh, high sulfur fuel oil uh, as the second best option. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. And thanks very much, Matteo, for your support. Um, can we move on to the next slide, please? Let's see what the impact of COVID-19 is. Now, because of uh, all the disruption in, in the uh, shipping supply chains that uh, Richard rightly spoke about, uh, there's a huge drop both in the volume of cargo and, of course, fuel demand. This has brought prices down for the time being. It may be a temporary phenomenon, but the pr prices of fuel have come down. Now, interestingly and ironically, while until uh, recently shipping companies were considering installing scrubbers, now they're, uh, so they're back to uh, cheap uh, fuel. Now it's cheaper for them you know, to use fuel because of the drop in, in their prices. But I would say that this phenomenon, again, is temporary. 
And I, I'm afraid that it's a disincentive. Instead of investing in, in uh, technological improvements and operational improvements, for the time being, uh, shipping companies are finding it easier, you know, to uh, use uh, cheaper fuel instead of investing in their technological uh, upgrading. Um, let's move on to the next slide, please. Uh, I think that, um, again, as I promised you, I'll raise more questions and I will provide answers. Uh, can we move on to, yes, the policy areas that need to be considered uh, in the dialogue between uh, uh, European and Asian stakeholders within the ASEAN framework. Uh, first of all, we have to keep in mind that this shift towards different fuels, alternative fuels and cleaner fuels, uh, requires massive investment. Interestingly, not that much in ships themselves, but infrastructure in the um, um, in a land-based uh, infrastructure like refineries, the ports themselves, the bunker industry, uh, let me tell you that um, out of the 700 uh, refineries in the world that happen to use um, high sulfur fuel oil at the moment, as we speak, some 200 may go out of business. They, they just cannot, you know, survive. So th th this will be a massive disruption uh, in terms of the land-based infrastructure required, you know, to shift to, to cleaner fuels in shipping. Uh, yet another issue is whether there are sufficient quantities of compliant fuel across the globe, including Europe and Asia. Um, let me tell you that Singapore, Fujairah in the uh, United Arab Emirates, or Rotterdam in the Netherlands, um, are expected to have compliant fuel supplies. But at the same time, smaller ports may find it difficult you know, to live up to, to this uh, challenge uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, what is also very important as a policy area is the role of banks in order to uh, you know provide loans for climate uh, compliant uh, uh, fuels uh, you, you cannot expect a, a bank clerk sitting behind a desk you not know, to understand all the technicalities of, of you know uh, clean fuels so the, the banks need a significant technical assistance and understanding you know of, of this uh, uh, the intricacy of uh, uh, climate compliant fuels as well. And yet there, there's the big question, the IMO strategic decision, you know, to impose this restriction on a low sulfur content is fine, but what is really the verification and above all the enforcement mechanism uh, to make sure that indeed this decision is being applied by, by shipping companies across the globe, including between Europe and Asia. Let's move on to the next slide, please. And I, I do hope it's my last one. The way ahead, uh, I would say, uh, we have to keep in mind that there are several sine qua non conditions in decarbonizing maritime connectivity. Of course, we need strong political commitment of governments in all the, the ASEM uh, um, member, member states. Uh, mind you, in Europe, there's a heated debate on whether or not shipping should be included in the EU emission tra emissions trading system. It's controversial, it's politically charged, but the debate is underway. Um, at the same time, it's quite clear that governments across, across the board will have to strike some very delicate deals, and, but necessary deals, with the shipping industry. And I would say my last point would be that, of course, uh, there's a technological revolution underway. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, uh, Roland Roche uh, spoke about this in the um, keynote speech right before this session. There are new alternative uh, fuels that are being considered, hydrogen being one of them. Um, and of course, I'm sure that there will be a long menu of new fuels, in, uh, clean fuels in the future. And yet, this will have to be based on a viable business proposal. A very uh, delicate balance to be struck between political will, which is much needed, and also uh, a meaningful um, fi financial proposal that needs to be put forward. And that will take a lot of uh, debates between stakeholders, be it private companies, uh, national governments, 
but I think that this is where Azim will have a role to play as a coordinator of this difficult but much needed debate. I'll stop at this and we'll be happy to take questions. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, in just the last sentence, uh, your voice was a little bit uh, noisy, so maybe uh, try to be closer to the microphone, please. So there are a couple of questions. Uh, the first uh, uh, from William, asking, uh, apart from uh, technical advice, do banks have uh, uh, any incentives of political encouragement to provide a climate compliant uh, lending to, for shipping? So there is uh, some political support to bank to have uh, to give this uh, phone sir, for um, this. Yeah, I, I can tell you that, uh, in fact, that there's a growing, what shall I say, momentum, that there's growing political will in, in the banking sector itself. The banks are actually looking at green investment. They know it's the future. They are thinking ahead. They know that this is not just a niche in the market, it's the future market. So I think apart from political or financial incentives provided by governments, uh, banks themselves are looking ahead and they are interested in investing in what will be their future. On LNG, uh, another question raised. Um, I, I think, again, that there's broad consensus that LNG is, a, is an interim solution. It's, it's better, it's cleaner than oil, of course, but uh, it still has a high content of methane, which is also one of the greenhouse gases. So LNG is an interim solution that will have to be phased out, you know, along the way. Um, right now, uh, the Americans are very much interested in selling their LNG, uh, but I would say that uh, um, by and large, LNG is um, uh, what um, a short-term solution. It's not what we need to look at when we talk about climate sustainability. Thank you very much. Uh, if there is another quick question, otherwise uh, I wait a few seconds uh, because of, of course, so when you have to speak, it's faster than we have to type. <laughs> And uh, seems not, uh, so thank you, Plamen, for your you. contrib contribution to this conference. Very appreciated. And so we can uh, move uh, to the next speaker, which is uh, Alessandro. Uh, can I see him? Alessandro Albana. Um, okay, start to introduce him. Uh, Alessandro Albana. Uh, came from Bologna, University of Bologna, which is the oldest university in Europe, with a dissertation on China maritime, maritime uh, vision and naval rise. And uh, he conducted a field research in China in many occasions and participated in China in several international academy conferences and uh, published in the field of Asian studies, political science, and international relationship. And, um, um, he's a guest editor of a special issue of International Journal of Taiwan Studies, uh, titled Taiwan, a Frontline of Democracy Under Threat. And uh, this publication is uh, forthcoming, so keep an eye on this. And uh, now he's uh, in the center of contemporary China studies. Um, he was a member of the leading European think tanks uh, delegation to China. And um, in uh, just uh, from last year, uh, he was assistant coordinator to a EU, uh, EU Asia Politics and Market Studies Platform, an international academic cooperation initiative involving uh, Bologna University, uh, Japan Aoyama Gakuin University, and to Tokyo University, and uh, Seoul Korea University. And uh, Alessandro is also a member of the Asian Institute in Bologna. And uh, uh, while waiting uh, uh, Alessandro appearing on the screen, uh, I can anticipate that uh, he will discuss on uh, geopolitical aspect of uh, North Europe versus South uh, Europe ports with respect to the Belt and Road Initiative. So the competition between uh, Mediterranean port and uh, North Sea ports. And now he's appearing. All right. Good. Now we'll wait the slides uh, that uh, I hope. Uh that 
Uh, sh shall I share them on the on the screen, or is it up yeah, to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are yeah. free to, to do what you like. So, okay. Uh, if not, you can take a, take a coffee since uh, Alessandro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, and good uh, morning. Or sorry, I tried to. Good afternoon from Singapore. Yeah, good, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on when where you are uh, located. Can you see my screen now? Yes. All right, good. Uh, so my presentation will uh, try at least to focus on uh, the implications of China's investment uh, in uh, European ports, and especially after the um, um, implementation of the Belt and Road uh, Initiative uh, took momentum uh, in Europe. Uh, so basically, uh, I start with uh, the understanding of the possible implications of Chinese investment on two specific regions within Europe, which are Central Western Europe, and I will name uh, the most important countries in the region for this research, of course, and Southeastern Europe, or more precisely, uh, the Eastern uh, Mediterranean uh, region. So what the question I will try to answer is whether, how and to what extent uh, a geoeconomic shift is taking place. So if there is uh, a kind of a shift in significance in geoeconomic terms from central western countries to, um, to the eastern Mediterranean uh, region. Uh, so to start with, I'll try to, um, you know, draw the framework. So the background uh, we are talking about is what we see basically in this slide. In uh, 2008, Costco, which is one of the main uh, uh, state-owned enterprises in China, uh, purchased um, a peer in Pyrenees. Uh, eight years uh, after, Costco acquired 67% uh, shareholding within the Pyrenees Port Authority. I think this is a pretty uh, much um, meaningful uh you know fact uh we have on the one hand we have costco which uh, basically means having big company with a direct uh chinese involvement and on the other hand we have a public authority which holds control over a strategic infrastructure uh in greece and uh the combination of the two i think is pretty much telling so we have uh, a company with a direct chinese in chinese influence uh, holding uh, a play within the port authority of Piraeus and with, 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 uh, by holding the majority uh, shareholding within uh, the port authority. Of course, there has been um, there have been good implications for Piraeus as we see from this uh, data. The combined container throughput uh, passed from 880,000 20 foot equivalent units in 2010 to 4.91 million uh, in uh, 2018. Uh, it, the, the increase goes by uh, 458%. And actually, at the moment we are talking, uh, Paris is the most, the fastest developing uh, port in the entire world. So this is uh, so much for, for Greece uh, by now. The other uh, key country, in the region, I assess is Italy. Why? Because in 2019, uh, Italy and China signed a memorandum of understanding on the BRI, meaning that basically Italy is the first G7 country to officially embark on the project and uh, you know to seek uh, closer convergence, closer understanding uh, with China in economic and um, and uh, political terms. What Italy wants uh, from the uh, Belt and Road Initiative is basically more involvement from China and Chinese state-owned enterprises in, in its own infrastructural system, meaning more investment from China in order to, you know, fill the gap uh, Italy is uh, kind of suffering from to a certain extent. In this regard, the port of Trieste has become, you know, a focal point of the entire, you know, uh, framework because um, the port of Trieste is basically a small, used to be a small port um, using uh, based on a multimodal setting, meaning that basically there is you know a joint platform for railway transportation and maritime transportation, and this has become increasingly important in the implementation of the bank as far as Italy is concerned. 
Uh, what about West, Central Western Europe then? Uh, Belgium, Germany, and Netherlands are the countries that I am um, focusing upon more, um, more specifically. Uh, this region is very much important because of uh, its long-standing tradition in terms of uh, maritime and, log and logistic um, affairs. So the most important hubs, uh, maritime, uh, maritime hubs in Europe are located in this region. And the, country I am man the countries I am mentioning have attracted relevant shares of Chinese infrastructures, Chinese uh, investments, without, you know, seeking too close convergence, too close, you know, um, commitment in political terms uh, with China. Now, the picture is closed by, this, uh, by this, this, this data, I think, that it's pretty much telling, which uh, basically reads that 10% of the uh, entire European container maritime logistic capacity is, uh, you know, invested by, or in uh, some way has a direct involvement by a Chinese state-owned enterprises. Well, uh, against this uh, backdrop, uh, basically we have two different readings of the current situation. So on the one side, we have, on the one hand, we have, uh, we see that um, a growing number of uh, political scientists IR uh, scholars and even uh, institutional rep representatives do see uh, this growing involvement from China, this growing interest and momentum from China in, uh, in, in, in European um, infrastructures and ports as, uh, you know, uh, a potential cause or uh, an actual cause of losing political cohesion within the EU. So basically, we have countries which are eager to attract China and uh, uh, countries which are, uh, you know, more prudent in this regard. And then the European Union will see that in more detail in a second. And this is cause for, you know, losing political cohesion according to, to such view. But on the other hand, of course, the Chinese perspective is very much different. So basically, at the end of the day, we will all win the Ch Chinese, European uh, countries and the European Union as well. Uh, so, uh, why do I think that, um, or do I see the Eastern Mediterranean uh, region as holding potential for becoming uh, more important in geo-economic uh, terms as far as the uh, Belt and Road Initiative is concerned? Since the, uh, the embedding of the Belt and Road Initiative, and especially in the past few years, um, Eastern Europe, uh, in terms of overland uh, infrastructure connectivity, railway connectivity, has attracted a lot of attention from China and a lot of investment from China. Then, um, you know, uh, on a different reel, the, in, to, in 2015, the Suez Canal has been expanded, uh, basically making uh, the passage navigation and shippings from the Mediterranean region uh, through the um, Red Sea all the way to the Indian Ocean region and uh, region and uh, East Asia much more comfortable, much more, uh, you know, much, uh, much smoother. Uh, geography matters a lot. Uh, uh, it has been mentioned um, uh, in the, during the first presentation. So from Shanghai to the Northern Adriatic, where Trieste is placed, actually, uh, it takes uh, 8,600 miles of navigation. Compared to uh, the length uh, dividing, you know, the, the length um, between Shanghai and Hamburg, uh, which is basically 11,000 miles, you know, the, the advantage is pretty much apparent, I would say. Oh, sorry. Um, so uh, in, this, in this framework, in this context, uh, Trieste, which is part of the Five, Port Ali Five Ports Alliance, I will, I, will, uh, I will explain briefly in a second, um, is receiving growing financial support and, uh, you know, money, basically from the Italian Ministry of Infrastructure and uh, the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs in, term, in terms of, of course, uh, political attention, so to speak. And uh, we have seen that um, CCCC, which is another important state-owned enterprise, uh, um, Chinese state-owned enterprise, is investing a lot of money in the port and the Belt and Road Initiative is placing uh, growing attention in the in the um, in, in this port uh, to 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 uh, to square to square um, you know to 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 close this picture uh, we have seen in the past few years that uh, big companies multinational corporations have already relocated their main distribution hubs in Europe from Central Western um, Europe. Uh, 
basically Rotterdam to uh, the Eastern Mediterranean region. Uh, we're talking about HP, Huawei, Hyundai, uh, Sony, ZTI, uh, I mean, um, big companies uh, seeking a new distribution up uh, in, in Europe and finding this new distribution up in, in Pyreus. Uh, this is uh, the five port, uh, five ports alliance I was talking about. Can you, can, you yes. go to, can you go to the end, please? Sorry. Yes. Uh, so this is basically five ports alliance, and um, the um, the picture is much more you know complicated when it comes to Central Western Europe, because we have countries uh, which are uh, you know which are okay to attract um, uh, PRC investments, but they show a more you know prudent approach as far as. Uh, you know, the involvement of China in strategic infrastructure, such as port, is concerned, and in terms of, you know, political relations. So it seems to me that there is a kind of emerging central Western paradigm where you have, uh, where, uh, you know, um, investments are welcome, but uh, the retention of uh, public control is uh, not in discussion. Uh, it's, it's not a matter of discussion or, uh, when it comes to uh, strategic infrastructures. So this is basically what we are talking about, the comparative advantage of Pyreus to other, vis-a-vis -vis other ports is what you see here in this table. Uh, to, um, to go to, to, uh, to the conclusion, there is a nexus between infrastructure and politics. Uh, so we have on the one side, Greece and Italy growing uh, increasingly, uh, you know, close to China in political and economic terms and a more prudent approach uh, in, in, in Central Western uh, Europe. Uh, the, the EU is, is, is the EU. The EU's approach is very much fragmented, as you see from uh, you know these documents. Uh, there is no comprehensive agreement on investment. It has been on the table since 2014, but you know it is still to uh, to go to to, um, to a comprehensive conclusion. But I have to do that. So basically, um, you know, the picture we have uh, drawn uh, sees the Eastern Mediterranean region as uh, you know enjoying a comparative advantage. Uh, determined by infrastructure development, its location, uh, its, uh, its um, um, logistic, logistic relevance for companies, and uh, you know the, the fact that it has uh, countries such as Greece and Italy uh, who are um, uh, were eager to engage China in diplomatic and political terms. Uh, so um, against this backdrop, I see that there is growing potential for the Eastern Mediterranean region to become. Um, more significant uh, for the BRI in Europe, and this will have you know some impact on on central western hubs. And uh, this uh, this this process is determining you know political processes as well, and uh, it suffers. You know there is a, a very relevant lack of a China strategy, comprehensive China strategy at the EU level. Uh, sorry for taking too much time, and thank you very much. Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, uh, if I count well, now there are three comments and three questions from Plum and Panos and Richard. So I try to read it for, uh, quite quickly and please provide the uh, answer also faster. So the comment, the first comment of Plum is uh, Costco shares in Pereus is 31%. And according to him, there is a lot of arm twisting right now on why they can go up to 67.5%. Uh, probably in 2021. This is a comment and the question, is Italy's golden power rule affecting Chinese investment in the country? Uh, I, I think, I, think I, I do not have, uh, you know, precise data, but I think that uh, for sure it will have an impact uh, on Chinese investment. But the point is that uh, besides that, I think that the uh, political will to attract, to, to get closer to China will have some kind of, you know, implications as well. And uh, for uh, the Costco share, um, uh, you, you, you state that it is 51%. With, well, I have different data, but I will try to, you know, double check. So yes, thank okay. you very much for... Okay, then there's a question and a comment of Panos. Uh, would you know how the commitment for improving the hinterland connection from Piraeus interest is going? And then the comment, uh, maybe you can agree or not. In my opinion, the strategic goal of the Chinese uh, is to increase the capture area for their shipments. But at the same time, a historical weakness for Greek and Italian ports. Uh, well, I think that the overland connection is uh, badly affected by the political fragmentation in West, in Eastern Europe. So, for example, you have uh, projects for railway connection between Hungary and Serbia, but then uh, you do not uh, really um, see that coming, so to speak. 
And I think that there is, uh, you know, attention on that. But uh, yes, of course, we are talking about potential uh, potential developments. So far, we didn't uh, we didn't see comprehensive, uh, you know, um, um, implementations of projects. But in Piraeus, which I think it's the most the most impressive, you know, inroad of China in in Europe as far as uh, maritime infrastructures are, are are concerned. Thank you. And uh, last question and comment from Richard, uh, following up the panels one: How is important is China in uh, sixteen plus one now seventeen plus one arrangement in Eastern Eastern Europe? And according to him, it seems that. Uh, um, uh, China is responding to you, divide and rule concern, and north-south rail links from Paris to Baltic as south. Uh, so, what is your comment on this? I, I think that this, the, 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 the passage from 16 plus 1 to 17 plus 1, basically including Greece, uh, is, is, a, is a clear uh, epitome of, of what I said. There, there is a clear infrastructure politics network, uh, sorry, nexus. Uh, I'm not uh, determining who causes what, But um, we have seen that uh, increasing convergence in economic terms uh, between uh, Greece and China has brought about some consequences, consequences on the political realm. So basically, Greece has joined the club and it's part now of the 16 plus one, making it 17 plus one. And the second is, um, yeah, I think that China is playing a very risky game uh, Now, uh, it used to be much more, you know, uh, convenient. Uh, it used to be much more, you know, comfortable before. But now, according even to the last, uh, to the latest events, to the latest meetings between European, you know, representatives and Chinese representatives, it seems to me that Europe is going much more concerned regarding what China is doing in, uh, in, in Europe. And I think that China is in a pretty... Uh, you know, unstable or uncomfortable situation at the moment. So it, it has to play, to play carefully if it wants to, um, you know, maintain and develop and improve its relationship with, with Europe. Okay, thank you very much, Alessandro. Say hello to Bolu. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Town, beautiful university. So we can move to the next speaker. Uh, please, Panos and Yoko, show up. Uh, I apologize if you don't uh, give your full names uh, because uh, I would, would like to avoid uh, misspelling, of course. And uh, so Panos uh, is a senior researcher at the European Commission Joint Center in Seville, Spain. It seems that uh, Joint Research Center are always placed in nice places because uh, we have in Ispra in Italy, in Seville in Spain, very good choice. And uh, Panos is specialized in analysis of multimodal transport networks and connectivity. Uh, at all scale, ranging from uh, urban to international. He carried out several analyses on the impact of, on international aviation and agreement on economic development and competition. His main research focus is uh, in developing quantitative methods uh, in order to provide robust uh, evidence for policymakers. I would like to introduce also Yoko so he can appear. Uh, it be better to present both. And uh, Yoko is an energy economist uh, at the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia since 2018. Uh, okay, he's appearing. Now it's Panos also, before it was just Yoko. Uh, previously, he was a researcher at the European Commission Joint Research Center in Seville also, and then a transport mobility uh, Leuven in Belgium, before moving back to Indonesia and joining uh, uh, area. Uh, in there, he works uh, on development of several ASEAN countries, energies of the outlook, as well on several transport-related studies in the region. So, uh, uh, they will share the talk, so start, we start Arnold and Yoko, and uh, the main uh, subject of the talk uh, is uh, concerning the possibility and advantage, or not, of direct flight, uh, so I understand, uh, between Europe and Asia versus intermediate stop flight. This will be very good for me because from Italy to Singapore, there is just three times per week Singapore Airlines direct flight. So I have to stop uh, in Emirates, uh, in Qatar, uh, in other places. So I would be happy to know if direct flight connection will improve in next year. So, uh, Thanos, uh, uh, you have the floor. You can upload your slide or you can confirm it. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, yes, I think it would be better if Matteo did it so that we avoid additional uh, complications. Okay, Matteo, back to work, please. So, uh, uh, 
uh, presentation from uh, try to go uh, very quickly through the uh, through my slides so that I have time to talk so, about sorry the to interrupt about, Panos. Uh, uh, the, the policy okay. issue so we have two parts uh, one is uh, what is uh, what are the indicators for connectivity between Europe and Asia for aviation Panos, can you speak a bit louder sorry Panos, can you speak louder uh, yeah, and, and, and then how do we see uh, the prospects of uh, some policy initiatives that uh, uh, that are... I, I think we have some problems with uh, Panos connectivity. Can... So Yoko, we are trying to switch the talk and get back Panos. Hello? Hello. Can you okay. hear me? Can I share my own slide? Yeah, if you yes. like, sir. Just wait, uh, I introduce briefly you very shortly because we are a little okay. bit in the line. So it's, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Ellen Putri Edita. Uh, she obtained a bachelor degrees in environment, environmental and engineering at uh, Dipro Negoro University uh, in Indonesia in a master degree uh, at Lund University in Sweden. And uh, she's uh, passionate about sustainability related issues, particularly in the complexity of political, social, economy, and environmental relations, which led, uh, which led uh, to inequalities. And uh, while pursuing her master's degree, she and her team had a chance to create a terrible policy suggestion for Malmo, uh, Malmo municipality in, uh, in Sweden. And um, in addition to her academic activity, she was co-founder of a startup called SuperTemp, which serves as an alternative to sustainable food in Sweden. And at present, uh, she works at a research associated uh, as a research associated in Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, where she is involved in research and developing regional knowledge center for um, marine uh, uh, plastic debris in ASEAN plus three countries. And is uh, in a, her nice talk. She will discuss uh, somehow the social and the environmental impact in the realization of a new big airport in Indonesia. So please uh, go ahead. Pan, sorry, uh, since we miss you, we are switching the two talks. So now is Please go ahead, Ellen. Thank you very much for the introduction. So uh, let me share my screen. Can you see it now? Can you see it now? Okay. So, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Ellen Butredita. I'm from Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. And uh, Today, I would like to present my research. It's basically uh, my master thesis when I did my master degree at Lund University, Sweden. So the title of my presentation today is Aerotropolis at what cost to whom? An analysis of social and environmental impacts of New Yogyakarta International Airport Project in Indonesia. So before going further into my presentation, so I would like to highlight about Aerotropolis. So what is Aerotropolis? The aerotropolis can be defined as an area uh, which is centered in an airport funded by non-aviation facilities, and all of them work together to gain economic benefit. So this is pretty much what I would like to deliver today. I hope I have uh, enough time to deliver all of them. And the background of the research is uh, started uh, with this. So in 2011, the former president of Indonesia, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, launched a master plan for acceleration and expansion of Indonesia's economic development. So the main idea of the master plan is to transform Indonesia as a developed country in 2025 with the GDP up to 4.5 trillion US dollar. And within that master plan, Indonesia will be divided into six economic corridors, as you can see in the picture. So the economic corridors will, um, will be used to connect uh, the, each 
each region of Indonesia so the economic development can be evenly distributed to throughout the country. So as you can see in the picture, if I want to go to more details, so uh, the city of Yogyakarta is actually plays a very important role between the two economic corridors in Java and Bali and Nusa Tenggara as a uh, center of economic and center of tourism. So that's why the establishment of the new airport in Yogyakarta is very important to support the role of city of Yogyakarta in the future as center of economic and tourism. Also, um, uh, the establishment of the airport is also legitimized with the fact that the old airport in Yogyakarta, Adi Sucipto, cannot accommodate more passenger anymore. And it's also located in the very center of the city, so it cannot be expanded. In this regard, so the uh, Yogyakarta city or Yogyakarta province needs a new airport, which is bigger that ac can accommodate more passenger. However, at the same time, there was the tension uh, from the local people because most of the local people who lives in that new airport area depends on agricultural land to make the living. So they are opposing the, the airport. And also there is a concern about the delay of the environmental assessment document uh, for the airport establishment. So I did the field work last year uh, to the location of the airport. So uh, after doing the field work, so I can see the problem in a bigger picture. So what I found in the field, there were several social impacts happened because of the airport establishment. So we can see here there are four main social impacts, displacement, relocation, poor compensation, and loss of livelihood and identity. So I would like to highlight about what I got from talking with the local people. So they mentioned that we are now here not because we agreed with the airport establishment. Since the airport is built for the sake of the country, we have no option. So we can observe here that no matter what happened, no matter what they do, so the airport will be still developed because it's the part of national master plan. So they have no choice but to obey the, the, the government. And also for the fourth point, loss of livelihood and identity. This is the part that is not really acknowledged by the airport stakeholder because they think after giving the local people compensation by giving them the money, uh, the problem is finished. But it is not like that because some of the local people thought that uh, being farmers is uh, irreplaceable for them. So because farm by uh, being the farmers, they have the, their own land and they can you know, live from their own land and they can make their family survive. And after uh, the establishment of the airport, they lost their land and they don't have uh, their uh, livelihood anymore. The establishment of the airport also sparked uh, the concern about the environmental impacts because this is reflecting from what happened uh, in Yogyakarta because Yogyakarta recently uh, experienced massive development and a lot of the development uh, really needs a high supply of water and there was a water shortage issue in Yogyakarta and this possibly uh, can happen if uh, the airport establishment also uh, developed in Yogyakarta because of with the concept of the aerotropolis uh, the development will uh, need uh, more water supply and also because the airport is located very close to the beach, there will be the possibility to uh, for the shoreline changes in the future because uh, the airport establishment might get wider and wider and it really needs uh, the land to, to uh, support the, the establishment of the supporting facilities. Okay. And then next, uh, we, go, we go to the discussion. So all the things that happened in the field, in the airport establishment, is actually very related with what happened in the global scale. So in 2008, uh, there was a global crisis that makes Asia and ASEAN countries collapse. And in, in, in this regard, uh, the ASEAN countries 
in order to recover, they created master plan for ASEAN connectivity where they can, you know, connect one region to each other so they can support uh, and foster the export activity. And also because some of the ASEAN countries uh, doesn't do not have enough funding for creating appropriate infrastructure for connectivity, they relied on public-private partnerships. So all these mechanism also uh, portrays the neoliberalism practice. And uh, about there's also the political opportunism in the uh, in this case because. Uh, when the airport uh, was established, uh, the president, uh, President Joko Widodo, launched law number 98 of 2017, which explicitly mentioned that this airport should be finished in April 2019. Uh, and what happened in April 2019? There is a presidential election. So uh, probably the president used the airport to uh increase his popularity uh towards the presidential election and this is my last slide so uh, just to sum up so the aerotropolis is also actually portrays the sustainability challenges because from the crisis that happened started in the us it affects the countries in asean and also indonesia and because of that the airport is established with Aerotropolis concept. And it also related to sustainability because it portrays uh, the global to local relationship. And also there is an intertwining relation of political, economic, environmental, and social relations. So in the end, uh, the Aerotropolis of the airport will uh, bring the benefit for some group of people but some of them might be left without any option. So that's pretty much my presentation. Uh, so this is my email address. If you want to discuss further, that I will be happy. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you much for this nice presentation. If there are questions, uh, you mentioned some political implication. Uh, if I'm not wrong, but uh, I apologize, no? but the president uh, came from the same region of the airport. Uh, is correct? Yep. Yeah, so is, uh, this not have uh, some uh, benefit for the local populations since uh, she, he came from the same region? Uh, not really the same, but yeah, um, pretty much like that. Yeah. Okay. And uh, um, concerning the res uh, resistance from population, the problem mm -hmm. uh, has been kept uh, as before or some uh, modification to partially meet the demand of the local people has been done or just uh, the project uh, went uh, uh, as a schedule uh, in the same dimension, uh, same uh, impact and so on, which is uh, the, the value of this resistance. Uh, so they get more money or more land. Uh, can you comment about this? So, uh, I'm sorry, could you please come again? I don't really get what you... I mean, uh, when this project started, of course, you mm -hmm. mentioned there was some discussion with yep. the population, of course. Yep. Did mm -hmm. help with some modification on uh, in the project or some more benefit for the local people or this kind of uh, struggle was not worth uh, for anything? Okay. So there was the socialization before the airport being established. Uh, so the airport stakeholders met the local people and there's, there was a discussion, many discussion actually, but of course some of them uh, uh, see this as a problem, but some of them see this as a treasure because um, probably uh, some of them really see that, okay, I will get the money from uh, selling the land to the stake, airport stakeholder, but some of them think that okay, this is cannot have this cannot happen because uh, my land is not for sale. So uh, there will be uh, there is a very you know the tension between people who agreed and who disagreed. Okay, so if there are no other questions, thanks a lot for your presentation. Thank you so much. Now we can move uh, to the previous talk. Panos is still online, don't show him his pretty face, as you mentioned in the comment, <laughs> just to see it then. And so uh, you can upload uh, your presentation again, please. So if Matteo can, uh, can do it, or... 
Mateo, please. So perhaps it was also a good opportunity that Ellen presented first because this gives uh, some points for uh, for us to uh, to connect to. Uh, so uh, apparently, after the crisis that Ellen uh, uh, told us uh, about, the uh, the air transport market in uh, in Asia has recovered uh, uh, impressively. So if we go to the next, uh, Matteo. So uh, the the market in Asia is larger than either the uh, the European or the the US uh, market, both in terms of. Uh, passengers and in terms of uh, uh, income. And this is simply uh, the current situation with the average uh, uh, user in, uh, in China uh, and the rest of the, the zone traveling half as much as, uh, as uh, Europeans or, uh, or Americans. So if things had developed as expected before the pandemic, we would have expected this to grow even uh, even more. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Matteo. Uh, so, uh, the other very uh, interesting fact is that uh, uh, the sorry, I cannot see very well. The uh, the other very interesting fact is that. Uh, uh, the connections between uh, uh, the various regions, regions across uh, uh, the world give a very interesting uh, picture. Uh, Europe is very well connected to, uh, uh, to, to America and most of the other zones, surprisingly, probably because of the, of the distance, the, the number of direct connections through Europe and Asia are still very low, taking into account the, the population and the economic activity in both regions and between the two regions. But as you probably see, there are, there are between Europe and the Middle East and others uh, between Asia and the, and the Middle East. That, as we can see in the next slide, please, uh, uh, Mateo, uh, the number of, uh, the share of direct connections between uh, uh, the zones is uh, uh, limited this doesn't so very well but uh, what we can see here is that uh, uh, the links uh, between the three zones in asia so central asia uh, uh, Indian, uh, subcontinent, uh, east asia and south asia are rather good especially between uh, southeast asia and the other two main uh, parts uh, next slide please Uh, but if we see, uh, yeah, that, that was yeah the previous one first, please. Okay, that, that's it. Uh, that's the, the missing part. Uh, but only 14% of uh, uh, of uh, flights uh, uh, to the Indian subcontinent, 27% to uh, East Asia, and 16% uh, of South in Southeast Asia are direct which is uh, Nicola's question before, what are the prospects of uh, flight directly from uh, Milan to Singapore to, to increase in frequency? Uh, before the pandemic, we would say, uh, yes, we expect more direct flights and less uh, uh, connections. If you can go to the next slide, uh, please, uh, uh, Matteo. Uh, because this is a, a very, uh, Easy principle: the, the more demand there is between the uh, the main cities in uh, uh, in the two areas, uh, the more direct uh, links you have instead of having to use a hub in between. And uh, the other connection with uh, uh, with Ellen's uh, uh, presentation is that we see here that there are some regional important destinations like Jakarta emerging in the process. This uh, this is the situation in 2019, and you can see al already the emergence of many destinations on both sides that uh, accommodate direct flights for the uh, interconnection. But uh, next slide, please, uh, Matteo. But as we will see in the next uh, slide, 
the situation in terms of transit flights is, uh, is very different. So uh, on both sides, we have some major uh, hubs that serve traffic from other destinations behind or, or beyond. But we see a very large share of, uh, of the trips to pass through the, uh, the Gulf airports and, uh, and Istanbul. Uh, while the, the number of regional uh, hubs in, uh, in Asia is, uh, is uh, lower. So again, based on the evolution that we were seeing until um, last year, we were expecting more regional hubs to evolve in the future, especially in uh, places like um, uh, Jakarta or the, the Philippines. But unfortunately, from what we've seen so far, this is also the market segment that is more sensitive to the crisis of, of, of the pandemic. So we unfortunately expect fewer direct flights to, to be viable. So Nicola, I'm afraid you will have even fewer chances. Let's hope that your flight will survive in the, in the future. And many more uh, uh, going through the main hubs in, uh, in the Gulf or the few big cities in, in uh, Europe and, uh, and Asia. And my last slide for my part, uh, the next slide, is simply to, to remind us all of, uh, of uh, the principle that is the same in uh, aviation, in maritime and all modes of transport for the hub and spoke uh, network, that geography plays a role, uh, distance is important, but also the straight line. So we would expect a, a good future for the hubs that are uh, near the, the straight line between the, the two continents, which includes most European, Central European uh, airports, uh, but even Afghans and, uh, and Istanbul. The Gulf purples have this great advantage that are exactly in the middle of the distance and exactly on the, on the line. And uh, some uh, uh, Southeast Asian airports like uh, Singapore are, could also say, uh, serve that role on the, on the other side. And now I pass the floor to Ko, who will uh, uh, tell us about the, the outlook on the policy side and what to expect from that side to influence um, the future connectivity between the two zones. Thank you, Panos. Okay, uh, Matteo, please, uh, next slide. So I would like to just uh, briefly present to you a politic initiative that uh, is uh, ongoing, that is uh, a negotiation on the uh, EU ASEAN Comprehensive Air Transport Agreement. So the uh, negotiation was launched mid-2016, uh, but uh, yeah, until at, at least uh, uh, the end of last year, uh, it was uh, it has already had like uh, eight eight round of discussion, but not yet uh, materialized. And I and I yeah and, and we are we, we are afraid that uh, with this situation of of pandemic, uh, it, it will be delayed. But we can see that this is also an opportunity to to relaunch again the uh, or to recover again uh, air transport uh, demand. Uh, in both regions. So it is, in fact, if it is materialized, then it will be the first block-to-block -block agreement of air transport uh, at intercontinental level. And it will cover a wide range of areas of gradual regulatory convergence, uh, mostly in the air, air traffic management, security, safety, as well as the uh, uh, market access and protection of uh, environmental consumer rights uh, and, and so on. Uh, there was a, a paper by Alan Tan uh, that reveals the possible three areas of agreement. So the first one is the uh, possibility to have full market access provision between the two regions. So like currently, we have what we call as the third and fourth uh, freedom in air transport. That means that the uh, airline from one region can, can pick up uh, passenger in other region, vice, uh, vice versa. Uh, but at the moment, there is there are some limitation, of course, uh, still 
in terms of frequency, capacity, or the aircraft types that are used in this kind of operation. And then the second one is the relaxation of the fifth freedom flight operations. That means that uh, an airline from, from uh, ASEAN region will be able to, to fly to, to Europe uh, to make intermediate stop in one country and then to another country. For example, uh, from Singapore, uh, as uh, Nicola expect, can can fly to to Milan and then continue to to, to Amsterdam. And at at all sectors, they can sell uh, seats or uh, freight service, uh, vice versa. And then at the end, uh, it is expected also that this kind of agreement will lift up restriction on code sharing that exists currently in air service agreements between the two uh, regions. This means that uh, when the kata uh, take place, we can expect that uh, airlines from both regions can, can freely uh, share code in uh, any, any routes uh, domestically or interregionally or interregional. So the, the last slide, please, Matteo. So uh, as Panos has mentioned, uh, Asian and as, as, uh, uh, Asia and, and, and Europe, we, uh, ASEAN and, and Europe in particular, uh, we have a lot of uh, lot of uh, activities in, in common. But the uh, but the, uh, the 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 extent of direct flights are very low. So it is it is then very important to 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 yeah to give full access market access in the form of direct non-stop flights between the two regions. Uh, it will increase the competition and. As we can we, we can see uh, that uh, we hope that uh, the share of 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 those islands as well as the uh, in, uh, at the level of airports will will in, uh, will increase so more more players will will be participating and have to have operations we will see uh, increasing competitions and with Qatar in particular we can hope that uh, that uh, that this kind of fifth freedom of operation that I mentioned before. Uh, will be also followed by the right to service to 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 serve on the third the third party. So, for example, uh, KLM can fly from Amsterdam to Jakarta and then to Surabaya and then uh, go on to uh, Auckland, and and that will be uh, that will be increasing the uh, the market access of both uh, both uh, both uh, regions uh, airlines. So it will increase also the uh, the point to point. And behind and beyond shares in in the connection between the two regions, and as the uh, code sharing will be more relaxed, then uh, much more agreement can be reached in terms of uh, joint marketing revenue sharing, and then we can hope that average travel costs will be reduced, and and we can hope that it will not be uh, happen uh, only at the domestic or interregional, but uh, of course in the international. Uh, international travel, so we can hope that uh, the the transit the transit flights will be reduced, and of course the share of the currently dominating uh, Gulf or Turkish uh, based airlines would be reduced, and more uh, ASEAN or uh, European uh, airlines can can take part on this uh, hub to hub operation for intercontinental uh, flights. So at the end. Uh, it is important also not to see this this kind of uh, kata agreement as a trespassing of uh, sovereignty sovereignty because uh, its country for uh, in particular asian countries can still play with uh, with the uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, with the lim limiting the, the the share of of owning the the airlines and then the, the this kind of joint uh, code share so that uh, the, the sovereignty will not be a, a matter or an issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, uh, to both for your this uh, nice uh, presentation. There are some questions from the audience. Uh, well, if no, uh, let's give you one minute sir, to type some question eventually. In case um, uh, you mentioned the panels that uh, uh, you're, uh, are you, I fully agree that uh, the COVID the epidemic in principle should. Uh, should favor a direct flight, but uh, on the other hand, uh, what's happened was just the opposite. So from Asia to uh, Europe, uh, Qatar Airlines was very, was very, was almost the only airlines to keep uh, flight. So you are obliged to 
to fly through Doha in, in this period. So there is a reason of, of this, about this, or can you have some explanation why the real the reality was the opposite of what we expected? So why in uh, some critical situation like epidemic, uh, uh, direct flight uh, were almost all suppressed while uh, one stop flight uh, were surviving? Uh, well, in fact, this is what I said, that uh, you would not have uh, direct flights to, to Amsterdam and you would have more okay. cases okay. going to stop in, uh, in Doha. The, uh, and that's what we are seeing right now. So at least for this first phase of um, the post-pandemic or the pandemic situation, the road, most of the flights are through, through the Gulf. The, the others don't have the critical mass to, to operate. and. Uh, this is a risk uh, in the long term that it will take time until these flights start operating uh, again. So you will have to go a, a lot through Doha and... Uh, uh, okay, and sorry. It is a question of, of the critical of the number of, uh, of travelers, of course, not a question of safety. Because for safety, for safety reason, of course, direct flight is much more safe because you avoid the uh, stop. Of course, both in safety terms and in sustainability terms, it's better to have the direct yeah. flights, but... Uh, okay. We cannot afford them. Okay, thank you so much, Joko and Panos. So I don't see any questions, so we are just in time. So I want to thank all the speakers for this uh, very interesting aspect of transport connectivity. Uh, I think the subject uh, is so complex uh, and so wide. Uh, with, uh, many future scenarios uh, that will require a full conference fully dedicated to this. Uh, COVID-19 uh, will uh, impact uh, a lot uh, many or all of the current plan in the schedule and future decision. Uh, for the moment, uh, uh, COVID-19 has impacted our coffee break, but the organizer were able uh, to, to set up a coffee break. Of course, you have to bring your own coffee. And this gives me the chance uh, to thank not only the speaker and the audience, uh, but the organizer of this uh, conference and it will end uh, soon after the coffee break. I would like to thank Anna, Anna uh, that I met uh, personally in Italy one year ago, Williams uh, that in with, uh, with whom I've been in contact many times and during this period, and Matteo, Matteo who pro was providing uh, excellent support uh, in thank this you, situation and for te all the technical aspect. So thanks, uh, thanks to everybody.